Good morning. Um, today we're going to be um, continuing in our study of the Psalms. Um, we're going to be in Psalm 90 today, so if you'll grab your Bible or your iPad or your phone so you can follow along, we'll be in Psalm 90. Lord, you have been a dwelling place in all generations. Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever you had formed the earth and the world, from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. You return me into dust and say, Return, O child of man, for a thousand years in your sight, but are as yesterday when it, when it is past, or as a watch in the night. You sweep them away as with a flood. They are like a dream. They are grass that is renewed in the morning. In the morning it flourishes and is renewed. In the evening it fades and withers. For we are brought to an end by your anger. By your wrath we are dismayed. You have set our iniquities before you, our secret sins, in the light of your presence. For all our days pass away under your wrath. We bring our years to an end like a sigh. The years of our life are 70, or even by reason of strength, 80. Yet their span is but a toil and trouble. They are soon gone, and we fly away. Who considers the power of your anger and the wrath according to the fear of you? So teach us to number our days, that we may have a heart of wisdom. Return, O Lord, how long? Have pity on your servants. Satisfy us in the morning with your steadfast love, that we may rejoice and be glad in all of our days. Make us glad for as many days as you have afflicted us, and for as many years as we have seen evil. Let your work be shown to your servants, and your glorious power to their children. Let the favor of the Lord our God be upon us, and establish the work of our hands upon us. Yes, establish the work of our hands. Thanks, Amber. Well, this morning we are continuing our sermon series in the book of Psalms. And if you've been with us throughout this series, you know that we're not preaching uh, consecutively through all 150 Psalms. Instead, we're preaching through just selected Psalms that we feel like would be appropriate and helpful uh, just when it comes to the life of our church. And so then this morning we're going to be in Psalm 90 um, here this morning. And then starting next week, um, we're going to be preaching through different selected uh, messianic psalms or, or royal psalms, as they're called, as we make our way through the, the Christmas Advent season in preparation uh, for Christmas. And so that's where we're headed, um, especially, yeah, this morning, Psalm 90, and then starting next week, looking at different messianic psalms um, in celebration of, of Advent. So Psalm 90 here this morning. And as we begin um, Psalm 90 this morning, I want to begin uh, this sermon basically the way that I've begun a lot of my sermons throughout this um, sermon series in, in Psalms, and, and that's with the question. And the question this morning when it comes to Psalm 90 is, is this, how often do you think about death? How's, how's that for a question right after Thanksgiving? How often do you think about death? And when I ask that question, I, I don't mean death in general. I mean your death. Like how, how often do you think about dying? Not somebody else dying, but, but you dying. How often does that question, that thought, roll around in your, in your mind? And so then I know, like, that's not the first question you want to hear, especially like a few days after Thanksgiving, leading up to, to Christmas and, and the Advent season and all, all that. And I know at first glance you hear that question, that question kind of sounds a little morbid. It sounds kind of depressing. It sounds kind of strange. Like, who in the world wants to think about their own death? <laughs> who, who in the world wants to think about them, them dying? Like, who, who wants to think about that? Psalm 90 does. Like, that's the whole point and purpose of what we're going to see in, in Psalm 90. It's to, it's to get us, the reader, to think about our, our death, to get us to think about dying, 
It's the whole point of what we're going to see in Psalm 90 here. It's to, it's to get us to come face to face with the reality that one day we're going to die. And again, I, I know that sounds kind of, kind of morbid. I, I know that sounds kind of strange. But the reason that Psalm 90 wants us to think about our death isn't to cause us to despair. It's not to cause us to be anxious and, and to, to be all fearful. Oh, one, one day I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to die. Instead, the reason Psalm 90 wants us to think about our death is in order to teach us how to live. Do you catch that? Like that's what death does. Death is a teacher. Death is a teacher that, that teaches us, that, that helps us put things in perspective, that, that teaches us what's really important in this life, that, that gives us wisdom then for how to truly live. And so then if you want to know how to truly live, then you have to know and you have to think about dying. You, you can't know how to truly live and, and how to live this life unless you start at the very end and work yourself backwards. And you think about your own death and you think about dying and then work yourself backwards. Because when you do that, then, then death has something very, very important to teach us to frame our lives and give us this perspective on our lives and teaches us real, something really, really important about how to live while we still have breath. Like that's the effect in that Psalm 90 is to have on our lives here this morning. That this Psalm is here to do two things in our lives. Two things. First, it's here to remind us about the reality of our mortality and the reality of that, that, that we're going to die one day. That none of us are eternal. That every single one of us is going to die one day. But that's not all. It's not just to teach us the reality of our mortality. Second, it's to teach us then how to respond to the reality of our mortality. To teach us how to live, how to respond to the reality that one day we're going to die. How should the reality of that then cause us to live today? Well, that's what Psalm 90 is going to teach us here this morning. That's the effect I pray that it will have on our lives here this morning. And so let's begin here, and you see this on your hand out there. Let's begin with, with that first section and the first effect it's, this psalm is supposed to have on our lives, and that's to teach us about the reality of our mortality. We see this at the very top of, of the psalm in Psalm 90 here, that what we see here is that this psalm is a psalm that was written by Moses. That this is the only psalm in, in all 150 psalms that Moses is the author. This is the only psalm that he wrote. This is the only psalm that Moses authored. And because of that, this is probably the oldest psalm there is. This, this psalm, Psalm 90, probably predates all the other psalms. And there's a lot of debate then in, in regards to exactly when Moses penned the psalm and when Moses wrote this psalm. And, and scholars aren't necessarily for sure. We're, we're not told exactly when he wrote it. So we're not exactly for sure when he wrote this psalm. But what we do know is that in these first 11 verses here of Psalm 90, Moses highlights the reality of our mortality. And the way that he does this is by making a contrast. That in verses 1 and 2, he contrasts God's eternality with our mortality in verses 3 through 11. So let's first take a look at verses 1 and 2 in God's eternality. We see this in verse 1 and then also in verse 2. And Look there with me. In verse 1, Moses prays, Lord, you have been our dwelling place in all generations. Those two words there, dwelling place, can also be translated as the word refuge. That's how it's used over and over again in the Psalms. So Moses is declaring that the Lord is his and, and the people of Israel's refuge, meaning he's their shelter, he's their place of safety, he's their place of protection, he's their place of comfort. 
But as important as that, that is, the fact that God is our refuge, that's not what Moses is seeking to emphasize here in verse 1. He, he's not highlighting the fact that God has been their refuge, as important as that is. Instead, he's highlighting how long God has been their refuge. He's highlighting that God has been the refuge, did you catch that? In all generations. Like that's what Moses is emphasizing here. That, that Hebrew phrase there, in all generations, could literally be translated as generation by generation. Meaning one generation is born, lives, and dies. Then another generation is born, lives, and dies. Then another generation is born, lives, and dies. Then another generation is born, lives, and dies. And, and another, and another, and another, and another. And that continues on throughout all generations, generation by generation. Yet through it all, through all generations, there's one constant that remains from generation to generation. And that one constant is God. And specifically that God is our refuge. He's been our dwelling place. He's been our refuge in all generations. And the reality of that then highlights God's eternality. But that's not all. God's eternality is also seen in the fact that He is from everlasting to everlasting. That's what Moses goes on to say there in verse 2. Look there with me at verse 2. Moses says, Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever you had formed the earth and the world, from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. So think about that, especially you mountain lovers out there, right? Think about how old the mountains are, how long the mountains have been there. Like Pikes Peak in, in Colorado or the Smoky Mountains in Tennessee or the Grand Tetons in Wyoming or, or like Mount Everest. Seems like they've been there for forever. But the reality is these mountains, they all have a birth certificate. They all have a birthday. They all have a day and time in which they were born, in which they were created, in which they came to be. In the rest of verse 2, he says that the same is true then when it comes to the earth and the entire world in which we live. That like they all have specific days, specific times in which they were created, in which they came to be. But Moses' point is this, that's not the case with God. God doesn't have a birthday. God doesn't have a birth certificate. Because God never came to be. There wasn't ever a time in which God didn't exist. He always has been, he always was, and he always will be. Or as Moses puts it at the very end of verse 2, God's from everlasting to everlasting. Like, think about that. From everlasting to everlasting. That phrase there is a timelessness that goes in both directions. Meaning you go back in history and he's everlasting. Meaning he has no starting point. He's eternal. He always was. Or you go forward in time in the future and he's everlasting. Meaning he has no end. He has no expiration date. He always will be. He's from everlasting to everlasting. So God would... God doesn't have a starting point. He was never born. He, he doesn't have an ending point. He will never die. He's, he's forever. He's eternal. He's from everlasting to everlasting. And so then in verses 1 and 2, Moses is highlighting God's eternality. And the reason that he does that then is to help us to see and feel our mortality. And that's the contrast that Moses begins to make there in verse, in verse 3. Look there with me at verse 3. Moses tells the Lord, You return man to dust and say, Return, O children of man. So he's, again, he's making a contrast here. That whereas God exists in all generations and is, is from everlasting to everlasting, we're not. Instead, 
we were made from the dust, so we have a beginning, and we're going to return to dust, meaning we're all going to die. Like, feel that. That's the reality of every single person in this room. None of us gets out of this life alive. Like, no one. Instead, we're all just waiting our turn. We're all just waiting our turn, buying our time, waiting our turn until it's our turn to die. But as significant, as important as that truth is, our our mortality, that's not even the ultimate point that Moses wants us to see here. He doesn't want, just want us to see our, the reality of our mortality. He wants us to see, see something even, even deeper, even, even more significant than that. He wants us to see also just how short and how brief and how fleeting our lives are. Not just that one day we're going to die, but that our lives are brief. They're quick. They go by just like just like that. And that's why in verse, verse 4 he says, for a thousand years in your sight are but as yesterday when it is past, or as, or as a watch in the night. His mention, Moses' his mention of a thousand years here is probably a reference to Genesis chapter 5 and how long, the genealogy there, if you remember, and how long people live before the flood. If you remember there, the majority of those mentioned in the genealogy there in Genesis 5, the majority of them lived almost a thousand years. Methuselah was the the longest, lived 969 years. But Moses here is saying, even if we live that long, even if we lived a thousand years, that would be like yesterday in God's sight. Meaning it wouldn't be very long. It it would be brief. It would would be short. It would be just like like yesterday. Or at the end of verse 4, he says that a thousand years would be like a watch in the night. A watch in the night for for a soldier who stood at watch during the night. A watch in the night was four four hours long. Again, it was short. It was... It was brief. It wasn't very long at all. And so then put all that together. Do you see Moses' point? Let's make a lesser to greater than argument here. That if that's how long, if that's how quick, if that's how long or, or quick a thousand years are in God's sight, then imagine how quick 70 years or 80 years or 90 years would be in God's sight. That's how short and and how brief our our lives are in God's sight. In verse 5, then, he he continues with another metaphor to show, again, how brief and how short our lives are. So in verse 5, he says, you sweep them away, talking about our lives, as with a flood. They are like a dream. Think about this. Think about the last dream you had, right? What do you remember from that dream? Like most of us can hardly remember anything about the dreams we have. Why? Because they're, they're brief, they're, they're quick, they're, and then they're gone. And that's what our lives are like. They're like this just a short dream that just pops up and then it's, then it's gone. And we can vaguely even remember it. It's your life. In the rest of verse 5, he gives another picture then that illustrates how short and brief our lives are. He says that our lives, at the end of verse 5, he says that they're like grass that is renewed in the morning. In the morning it flourishes and is renewed, and then in the evening it fades and withers. And again, that's how short, how, how brief our lives are. They're like grass or like this, think about a flower, right, that springs up in the morning. And then the scorching sun hits it during the day, and so by evening it it withers, it fades away, and it dies. Like that's how quick our lives go by. Like one minute we're in the nursery, the next minute we're in the nursing home. Like 
we live, we do some things, and then we're dead. We're, we're here, then we're gone. Like, man, I, don't tell anybody this, but I turned 50 in May, right? Wow. It seems on some days, like I can remember when I was 10 years old, that seems just like yesterday. And there's a whole lot that's happened in 40 years of my life. Uh, a whole lot. Man, being 10 just feels like yesterday some days. Like 40 years have gone by. Man, just quick. Like I know we got a lot of young people in the life of our church. And I know what it's like to, I think I'm old now. I think I know what it's like to be young. You have the whole life, you feel like you have your whole life before you. You have all this time and all this whole, your whole life before you. And you have all the time in the world and to get to that and to get to that and all that stuff. I'm just telling you, fast forward however old you are, 30, be my age. Now, man, your life goes just go by quick. You blink and it's gone. And you're like, what? How'd, I, how'd I get to be 50? Where, where'd it go? Where'd it go? It's our lives. The brevity of our lives. You're born. You live. It goes back. You blink, it's gone. And you're dead. And it's over. And Moses here wants us to fill that. To, to fill the brevity of our lives and the mortality of our lives. They don't last forever and they go by really, really quick. Which then begs this question, why? Why, why is that? Why, why do we all die? Why does it all have to end that way for us? Why is death inevitable? Why is death inevitable outcome and end for all of our lives? Why, why is that? Well, Moses answers that question. He tells us there in verses 7 through 11. Look there with me. He says, For we are brought to an end, meaning we, we die. By your anger, by your wrath, we are dismayed. You have set our iniquities before you, our secret sins in the light of your presence. For all our days pass away, meaning they're quick. They just fly by under your wrath. We bring our years to an end like a sigh. The years of our life are 70 or even by reason of strength 80, yet the span is but toil and trouble. They are soon gone and we fly away. Who considers the power of your anger and your wrath according to the fear of you? You see what Moses is saying? He's explaining to us why we die, why you're going to die, why you don't last forever. And the reason that he gives here isn't biological. The reason he gives here is theological. Meaning we don't die, we don't ultimately die because of a medical issue. We die because of a sin issue. Like death is the consequence, death is the result, death is the punishment of God's wrath against sin. That's why you're going to die. That's why I'm going to die. That's why everyone dies. And why our lives are so brief. The reason we, we know that is because that's what the very first book in the Bible tells us. That the Bible opens with Adam and Eve living on earth, living in a garden, in a perfect world in which there's no death. Like no cancer, no heart disease, no hospitals, no doctors, no funeral homes, no caskets, no death. But then Adam and Eve rebel against God and they sin. And the punishment that they receive and the punishment that all of mankind, including us, receive for their disobedience and our disobedience against God is death. And so then that's why our lives are so brief and why we die. 
that death is the punishment and consequence for sin. And every single one of us in this room have sinned. And because of that, then every single one of us in this room is going to die. All of us. And all of that then begs this question. So what? So what? In other words, how should the reality that one day we're all going to die and that our lives are just so brief and fleeting and quick that we blink and we're dead, how should the reality of that then of that then affect our lives? How should it affect our day-to-day lives? How should the reality of that then affect how we live our lives here on this earth? Like, should it cause us to to be anxious and and afraid and and despair that, oh, oh, I'm going to die someday. I don't don't, know. Or should it cause us to be apathetic and and not care anymore, like, well, who cares? Who cares about work? Who cares about, who cares about this? Who cares about this? Who, who cares about anything? I'm gonna, we're all going to die. Like, none, none of it matters anymore. So why do anything? We're all going to die. Th- those are the two big ways that a whole lot of people respond to the reality of death and, and dying. Well, Moses and... Verse 12, really through the end of the psalm here in verse, to verse 17, is going to explain to us how we should respond. He's going to answer the so what question and how we should respond to the reality of our mortality. And he's going to give us four ways that we should respond. And the first way he gives us is this, is that we should number our days. We should number our days. So what he says in verse 12 here, look there with me at verse 12. He, he asked the Lord, he, he asked the Lord, he says, so teach us, Lord, to number our days that we may get a heart of wisdom. So the first word there in, in verse 12 is really important because it's going to tie everything that he's about to say in verse 12 through verse 17 with everything that he's just said in verses 1 through 11. He says in verse 12, so... Meaning, since our lives are fleeting, since we're all going to die, since that's true, teach us to number our days. That's the connection there. And so then if you remember, a couple verses earlier in verse 10, we saw that most of us only have 70 days, 70 years. Or for those of you who are strong out there, you've got 80 That's what he he says there in verse 10. Now, now in saying that, that's that's not an ironclad promise, right? That's not a a guarantee for for everyone here. Instead, this is kind of like an estimation. It's an an average of of how most people are, how many years most people are going to live. Which is kind of interesting because this week, I googled life expectancy for, for those in the United States of America. And the life expectancy for those who live in the United States of America, I think this was like four days ago, is 76.4 years. Like that's, that's all most of us get. That's, that's it. We get 76 years on average in four months. And so if you think about money or if our years were in currency or, or money, that means we get about $76. That's what you get. I spent about 50 of those $76. I got 26 left. Or think about decades, right? You get about seven and a half decades. That's what you get. I spent five. I got a decade and a half left. Teach us to number our days. Like, how about you? How, how, how long do you have? How many days? How many decades? How many, how many years? How many 
dollars if it was currency do you, do you have left? How many have you spent and how many do you have left? Many of you know the name Kirk Cousins. He's quarterback for the Minnesota Vikings. And from all accounts, he is a solid, strong Christian man. I was reading uh, earlier this week, article in Sports Illustrated, that Kirk Cousins has a big, tall glass vase or jar on his front porch. And in that vase contains 720 stones. And those stones represent how many more months he has to live until he turns 90 years old. And so then at the very beginning of every month, the first day of every month, when he walks out of his front porch, he, he grabs one of those stones. And he keeps in his pocket or his backpack the rest of the month. And as month after month after month after month has gone by, that glass jar filled with 720 stones has begun to get smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. Reminding Kirk Cousins of how many days or how few days he has left to live. Now, I'm not saying, and I don't think Psalm 90 is telling us that we have to literally number our days, where you need to get a calendar, and you need to do the math, and you need to figure out how many days, literal days you have left, or that you need to go get a glass um, jar filled with 720 stones or however many stones you need to put in there. So I'm not saying we have to literally do that, and I don't think that's a point of this verse, that we have to literally do that. At the same time, it's not a bad idea. <laughs> It's not a bad application of these, of these verses. So these verses aren't telling us we have to literally know, know how many days we have left, but, but I think it is telling us that we need, whatever we do, we need to do something to help us remember and to realize that our days are numbered. That our lives are like grains of sand. Just every second, just slipping through an hourglass that we never get back until one day they're all gone. And the reality of that then isn't meant to make us despair or freak out or be afraid or to be overly anxious or to be apathetic, like, well, doesn't, nothing matters anymore. Instead, the reality of knowing that is to make us wise. It's to make us wise. That's what Moses goes on to say in verse 12. Look there with me. He says, so teach us to number our days. Why? That we may get a heart of wisdom. Like that's what numbering our days is meant to produce in our lives. It's not meant to produce fear and apathy and despair. It's meant to produce wisdom. It's meant to remind us that we don't have an infinite number of days left to live. And the days that we do have left, they go by really, really quick. And so because of that, then we need to make the most of our days. We need to maximize our days. We need to steward the days that we have for God's glory and for God's purposes. And so then think about this for your life. Like think about it. How would your life look different if you knew that you only had a certain amount of days left to live? How would your life look different if you really began to number your days, what would you start giving your time to that you're not giving your time to now? What would you stop giving your time to that you're giving your time to now? How would it change your perspective? How would it change when it comes to what's really important and what's significant and what's, give, what's worth giving yourself to and your time to and your life to? That's the first way we should respond to the reality of our mortality. We should number our days. Second way we should respond then is this. We should cry out to the Lord for mercy. We should cry out to the Lord to have mercy on us. This is the next petition Moses makes there in verse 13. Look there with me at verse 13. Moses cries out, Return, O Lord, how long have pity on your servants? 
If you notice the first word there in, in verse 13, it's the word return. And that word could also be translated as the word relent, as relent or, or to turn from something. And that's how most translations translates this first word here, return. They translate it as relent or, or, or to turn from something. And so Moses here isn't asking God to return. He's asking God to relent, which then begs the question, relent from what? Well, he told us earlier, right, in verses 7 through 11. If you remember there, the Lord's wrath is against man because of, because of our sin. And because of that, then we all die. Death is the punishment we deserve because of our sin. And so then, do you see what Moses then is, is pleading to God for then? Moses is pleading then with God to relent, to have pity, to have mercy upon us, to, to not punish us for our sin and kill us. Well, guess what? This is a prayer that God has answered for us in Jesus. That even though we're the ones who deserve to die because of our sin, God had pity on us. God relented. And He did so by sending Jesus to die the death that we deserve as our substitute in our place. But Jesus didn't stay dead. Instead, three days later, he rose back from the dead, triumphing over death and the grave. And the Bible tells us then that those who trust in Jesus' death and his resurrection as their only hope for being rescued from the death that they deserve for their sin, that they will be shown mercy and that they will escape the punishment that they deserve for their sin. That doesn't mean then that we won't ever die in this life, but it does mean that we won't stay dead forever. Instead, when Jesus returns, our dead bodies will be resurrected and will live with Him forever in the new creation to come. What this means then is this, if you're here this morning and you're not a Christian and you're wondering, how should I respond to everything I've been hearing and reading in Psalm 90 here? Well, this is how you should respond. Your days are numbered. You're going to die. Your life is going to go by just like that until you're in a casket under the ground, dead forever. But what the gospel of Jesus reminds us is that death doesn't have to have the last word in your life. Instead, you can live forever. You can conquer death. If you trust and believe in Jesus' death and in His resurrection as your one and only hope for being rescued from the judgment that you deserve for your sin, from eternal death. This then leads to the third way we should respond to the reality of our mortality. And, and the third way is this. We should rejoice and be glad because of God's steadfast love for us. We should rejoice and be glad because of God's steadfast love for us. This is what Moses goes on to pray in verse 14 and also in verse 15. Look there with me. He, he asked the Lord to satisfy us in the morning with your steadfast love, that we may rejoice and be glad all our days, all, all 70 or 80 of those days that we have. Verse 15, make us glad for as many days as you have afflicted us and for as many years as we have seen evil. I don't know about you, but when you read, when I read verse 14 and 15, they sound kind of weird, right? Like, how is it possible to rejoice and be glad when you know you're going to die? Like, how, how's that possible? How's that possible to rejoice and be glad when you know your life goes by just like that, and you, then you're dead. Where is there any joy and gladness to be found in, in that? Well, do you know how you can rejoice and be glad even when you know you're going to die? By being satisfied with God's steadfast love. So Moses says in verse 14, right? He, he says, satisfy us in the morning with your steadfast love. Then here it comes, that... 
which is, he's going to explain then the, the result or the outcome now of being satisfied with God's steadfast love. Satisfy us in the morning with your steadfast love, that as a result, we may rejoice and be glad all our days. So you see the connection there? We're, we're able to rejoice, we're able to be glad all of our days, 70, 80, 80 years of those days. Even though we know we're going to die, Because of God's steadfast love for us. Which then begs the question, what's God's steadfast love? What what is that? Because whatever it is, that's what produces joy and gladness in our lives. Even though though we know they're not going to last very long and we're going to die. So what, what is His steadfast love? Well, we've seen those two words, right? Steadfast love over and over again throughout our sermon series in Psalms. Those those words, steadfast love, it's the Hebrew word hesed. It it means means God's covenant love, His his covenant-keeping love for His people. His covenant-keeping love for His people, and specifically, it's a reference to His loyalty, His his faithfulness to the covenant and all the promises that He made in the covenant to, to His people. His faithfulness to fulfill, his loyalty to fulfill and uphold all the promises that he made in the covenant that he established with his people. And so then if you remember, this covenant and and these promises began in Genesis chapter 3 verse 15 after the fall when God promised that that an offspring of the woman was going to come and crush the head of the serpent. And then God's, God's promises continued in the covenant then in Genesis 12 and Genesis 15 and Genesis 17 in the covenant that he made with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. If you remember when he, when he promised them that they were going to, that a great nation and this huge offspring is going to come from them and, and they're going to be formed in this great nation and he's going to place them in, in a land of their, of their own and he's going to shower them with blessing upon blessing. And his promises then continued in the covenant that he made with Moses and the covenant that he made with David when he promised that a king was going to come from David's line and he was going to usher in an everlasting kingdom here on this earth. And so then all these and and more are, are promises that God made to his covenant people Israel in the Old Testament. But now when we get to the New Testament, we see that all these promises have been and will ultimately be fulfilled in the person of Jesus. They'll be fulfilled when God's new covenant people, the church, dwells on the land of our own, the the new creation to come when Jesus returns. And when we'll live there in God's kingdom, under the rule of King Jesus, in God's presence, enjoying God's blessings forever and ever and ever. And since that's true then, we don't have to live in fear. We don't have to live in despair over the fact that one day we're going to die. Instead, we can rejoice now. We can be glad now all of our days because we know that God's going to remain faithful to the covenant and the promises that He's made to us in Christ. Promises that include living in God's presence in the new creation with King Jesus forever. Which then leads to the fourth and final way we should respond to the reality of our mortality, and we conclude with this. The fourth way we should respond is this. We should give our lives to things that will last. We should give our lives to things that will last. That's what we see in the very last two petitions that Moses gives here in verses 16 and verse 17. Look there with me at verse 16. Moses prays and asks the Lord, Let your work be shown to your servants and your glorious power to their children. Then in verse 17, he prays, Let the favor of the Lord our God be upon us and establish the work of our hands upon us. Yes, establish the work of our hands. So then, two times in this last petition there in verse 17, Moses makes the same request. Did you notice that? Two times. He says, Establish the work of our hands. Yes, establish the work of our hands. And so anytime an author repeats himself, he does so for emphasis, meaning this is the point. I'm highlighting something here. What's important to notice here is that this word establish here means to remain. It means to last. It means to endure. It means something that continues on. 
And so then put, put that together, right? So it's in light of everything we've seen in Psalm 90. As Moses is writing about the reality of, of his mortality, and as he writes about the fact that he knows that one day he's going to die, he knows that his life's not going to remain. He knows that his life's not going to last. He knows that his life's not going to endure. But he prays that the works of his hands will. Did you catch that? He's not going to last. <laughs> he's not going to remain. He's not going to endure. He, he's going back in the dust. So he prays that the work of his hands will remain, that they will last, that they will endure. Which is instructive for us, isn't it? Again, we're, we're all going to die. We're all going back to the dust. But the work of your hands, they don't have to die with you. They can continue. They can last beyond your life. They can endure and remain beyond, beyond your life here on this earth. They can carry on through your kids as you teach them the gospel and disciple them in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. They can carry on through your neighbors and coworkers and nations as you share the gospel with them. They can carry on through other Christians as you disciple them and model for them what it means to follow Jesus. They can carry on through your love and your generosity and your service toward others. Again, you're not going to last. We all have an expiration date. We're all going to die. But the work of your hands don't have to die with you. God can establish them. They can last. They can endure beyond your 70 or 80 years here on this earth. What that means then is then give your life to things that will last. Give your life to things that will outlast your life here on this earth. Give your life to things that will outlast 70 years or 80 years. Give your life to things that are eternal that will remain for generation upon generation upon generation upon generation to come. Give your life to the gospel. Give your life to this word. Give your life to following Jesus. Give your life to helping other people to follow Jesus. Give your life to the work of your hands that don't die with you. Uh, this is the effect then that the reality of our mortality should have on our lives. Shouldn't cause us to be apathetic. Oh, we're all going to die, so nothing matters. It shouldn't cause us to fret and fear and be in despair. Oh, I'm going I'm to die one day. Instead, it should sober us. It should cause us to count our days and number our days so that we would live the time that we have wisely in ways that are glorifying and pleasing and honoring to the Lord should cause us, if you're not a Christian, to fall on your knees right now and just plead for mercy from the Lord to save you and to trust in Jesus' finished work on the cross and His resurrection as your one and only hope to escape death and live forever. It should cause us to rejoice and be glad in God's steadfast love because death doesn't have the last word. God's steadfast love does. His promises that He's made to us the end in a new creation in God's presence in a kingdom where Jesus reigns forever. And it should cause us to live our lives, however many lives we have, years we have left, devoting ourselves to things that will last, praying that God would establish the work of our hands, that we would, give our, that we would work for things that outlast our lives. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for your goodness and kindness even in reminding us of hard truths and things that we don't like to think about, things that we like to push back and, and think that, oh, that's, that's way down the road. That's way out there. That's, that's a long time from now. But Lord, help us to pray that you would use just even this chapter in Psalm 90 to shake us and kind of wake us up to how we've fallen, many of us have fallen into a pattern and just mindset that things will always be this way. We'll always be this age. We'll always work this job. Things will always be the way that they are now, but the reality is 
It's all going to fly by. And we're all going to be dead. And I pray that the reality of that truth wouldn't cause us to fear or be in despair. Pray that the reality of that truth would, would have its effect in those ways that we've seen in verses 12 through 17. Uh, work that in our lives. Help us to be good stewards to make the most of our days. That we would number our days aright so that we could live and devote ourselves to things that far outlast us. In Jesus' name, we pray these things. Amen.